If you've ever opened up a Nintendo game cartridge, you would notice a series of chips, some of which are memory chips that contain the code for the game. But how does the CPU read that memory? Today, we're going to deep dive into that topic as we talk about the memory mapped architecture of the Famicom and the NES. This is episode three of my series called Inside the Famicom. In the first two episodes of the series, I talked about the overall design of the Famicom and we dug into how the 6502 CPU works. In this video, I'm going to continue that discussion and we're going to take a look at how the CPU interacts with other system components through the memory mapped architecture. In the last video, I pointed out that the Ricoh processor has a set of 16 pins that are on this system's address bus and a separate set of eight pins that are connected to the data bus. Now, a bus is like a roadway. Similar to how a road connects houses in a neighborhood, any chip that's on the bus is physically connected to other chips that are also on that same bus. And this lets the two chips talk to one another. For the Famicom, the address bus is 16 bits wide meaning that there are 16 different individual connections between the chips on this bus. The Famicom CPU is connected to this bus, so the 16 address pins on the Ricoh processor are physically wired into these connections. These are labeled A0 through A15. The Famicom also has a two kilobyte memory chip that's also on the same bus but instead of 16 address lines, only the first 11 are connected. Because these two chips are physically connected, the CPU can set any of these lines to either high or low, and the memory chip can read that signal. But it doesn't really do any good to only have the address bus connected. You also need a data bus. The data bus on the Famicom is eight bits wide. So there's eight individual connections on that bus. And like the address bus, the CPU and memory chip both have eight data pins that are physically connected to those lines. So with both the address bus and data bus connected, the chips can now fully interact with one another. For example, if the CPU wants to read a byte of data from memory, it can put the memory address on the address bus by setting each of the 16 connections to either high or low. The memory chip can then read those signals to determine which address the CPU wants data from. And in turn, it places the one byte of data from that address on the data bus by setting the eight data lines to either high or low. The CPU can then read the data bus and store that one byte of data into one of its registers. And the fact that there's eight data pins is what makes this an 8-bit CPU. If you were to look at a 16-bit processor like the Motorola 68000, you would see that it has 16 data pins. And of course, more data pins means that more data can be exchanged in a single CPU operation. But the CPU needs to do more than just read data. Sometimes it needs to write data to a memory location. So to help the chips on the bus determine if there's a read or a write operation needed, there's a connection from the CPU that's designated as a read or write signal. If the read write pin is set to high, then the CPU wants to read data from the bus. But if it's set to low, then the CPU is telling the chip that it should read the data that the CPU put on the data bus. The example we've been using isn't quite realistic because there's only one chip on the bus. In reality, there are multiple chips and the CPU could be talking to any one of them at any given time. In fact, every time you insert a game cartridge into the Famicom, you're adding another chip onto the CPU's data and address buses. This chip is called the program ROM 
and it holds the game's code. So in episode 2, when we were looking at the code snippet from Super Mario Bros., the CPU would have been reading those instructions from the program ROM on the Super Mario Bros. cartridge. But now, when you add additional chips onto the address and data bus, the CPU has a problem. How does it make sure that only the correct chip responds to its read or write requests? To accomplish this, each chip has a special pin called chip select. If chip select is high, the chip is inactive and it'll ignore any requests coming from the CPU. But when chip select is brought low, it knows that the CPU is talking to it and will therefore process the request. To make this work, the chip select connection can't be shared by other chips. Each chip needs its own dedicated chip select signal. But if you were to wire each chip's chip select signal to the CPU individually, the CPU would require several extra pins that are dedicated to activating each chip. So instead, the chip select signals are activated by using an address decoder. And that's this chip here, a 74LS139, which is labeled as U3. There are two separate and independent decoders on this chip. Each decoder has two inputs and four outputs. When the chip's turned off, all four output pins are held high. But when the chip's enabled, the state of the output pins depend on the input signals. If both inputs are low, then output pin 0 is low and the remaining output pins are high. If input pin A is high and B is low, then output pin 1 is taken low while the others remain high. When A is low and B is high, then output pin 2 is low, and when both A and B are high, output pin 3 is low. So you can see how different combinations of the input signals will select a different output line. The output lines from this decoder are tied to the chip select signals of each chip on the bus. And the input signals are connected to the address pins on the address bus. So if address pins 13 and 14 are both low, for example, then the internal 2 kilobyte RAM chip is selected. This allows each chip to occupy a specific address space. And as a byproduct, you get a mapping of different address ranges to different chips. And this also results in some interesting behavior. Let's take a look at the CPU memory map that's documented on the NES dev wiki. You can see here that it identifies this first 2 kilobyte address range as belonging to RAM chip U1. But it also shows that the next 6 kilobytes of addresses also belong to the RAM chip. And it says that this memory is a mirror of the first 2 kilobyte address range. Now that you know how this works, you can see what's really happening here. There's not another physical copy of this memory anywhere on the board. There's only one chip, and it's only 2 kilobytes in size. But if you look at the schematic, you'll see that the chip select signal for this RAM chip is enabled when address lines 13 and 14 are both low. And you'll notice that only the first 11 address pins are physically connected to this chip. So when this memory chip is selected, the address signals on 11 and 12 are completely disregarded. So a memory operation on address 0700 is accessing the same memory as an operation on address 0F00, 1700, or 1F00. While the memory mapped architecture is useful for connecting the CPU to multiple memory chips, that's not the only thing that memory mapping can do. In addition to memory chips, the CPU can also use this technique to talk to other processors. And in the case of the Famicom, this is how the CPU talks to the Picture Processing Unit, or PPU. The PPU handles the various video aspects of the system, such as rendering the graphics and providing a composite video signal. We're going to cover the PPU in more detail in a future video that's dedicated to the design of the graphics system. To enable the CPU and PPU to communicate, 
the PPU has three address pins on the CPU's address bus, as well as eight data pins on the data bus. And like the memory chips, the PPU also has a chip select signal, which is generated from pin 5 in that 74LS139 decoder that we looked at earlier. And to enable this chip select signal, pin 2, which is connected to address line A13 on the address bus, needs to be set to high. So when the CPU wants to talk to the PPU, it uses the portion of the address space that's dedicated to the PPU in the memory map. And because address pin A13 activates the PPU's chip select signal, the PPU uses the entire address range from 2000 through 3FFF. But because only three address lines are connected to the PPU, the PPU can only receive eight different address combinations from the CPU. So just like we saw earlier with the RAM chip, all the address lines from A3 through A12 are completely ignored. And this results in that three bit address space being repeated 1024 times. Before we wrap up this episode, there's one more piece of the memory map we should look at. And that's this range of 32 addresses from 4000 through 401F. When these addresses are used in an instruction, the CPU doesn't use the bus. Rather, the address and data signals are routed internally. Most of them will get sent to the audio processing unit or APU, which lives inside the RICO chip on the same die. But two of these addresses, 4016 and 4017, regulate the signals on the pins that are connected to the controllers. Some people really love the 6502's memory mapped architecture, and others prefer a port-based architecture like the one used in the Intel 8088. But whether you love it or hate it, this approach was used in many implementations of 8-bit consoles early on. In the next episode, we're going to switch gears and start talking about the Famicom's graphical capabilities. We'll take a look at a different chip that helped put the Famicom on the map, the 2C02 Picture Processing Unit. But that's all I have for you today, so I'll see you next time. But as always, until then, go make something cool.